So um, let me let me all welcome you here for the Tans lecture of this year. It is really a full house, and it reminds me of the fact, and this is pretty embarrassing to Professor Clark, that I also gave this Tans lecture once. Uh, three years ago, and I think it was filled up to the four rows from here. It goes to show that this topic is, of course, of great interest to students, but I think also to citizens here in this city, because, of course, 1914 is, of course, something which many people from their parents, their grandparents, my own grandfather, fought in the war uh, on the Belgian side. It would have been nice to hear, be here with my colleague, Martin Paul president of the universities, whose grand family also fought on the German side. And of course, the citizens here in Maastricht witnessed, of course, the beginning of that war by just climbing on the Mescherberg, and they could see the German troops invading or trying to cross at that time the river Meuse and all the opposition which then occurred, leading to the first set of atrocities of Germans in Belgium, which is, of course, one of the features which I, as a kid, was very much taught in courses, etc. So it's a particular delight to have here with us tonight uh, Professor Christopher Clark. Let me just read a couple of things about uh, Chris. was educated at the Sydney Grammar School between 1972 and 78, and afterwards the University of Sydney, where he studied history and between 1985 and 87 at the Freie Universität Berlin. And then Chris moved to Cambridge, where he obtained his PhD, having been a member of Pembroke College in Cambridge, and finally became their professor in modern European history. In September 2014, he succeeded Richard Evans as Regis Professor of History at Cambridge. Chris is an Australian, and uh, from an Australian perspective, it's of course very interested to see how you can explain this great interest in history. And as he has said, um, he recalls being fascinated at the age of 10 by Unstead looking at history, the Middle Ages. And as he says, I like the restrained clarity of the text. Pilgrims usually walked on their long journeys and the use of contemporary illustrations. The effect was one of distance, a sense that we must take seriously the differences between then and now. There were no courtesy exercises of the kind that came along in later textbooks. I hated all that stuff. But then the Lord of the Rings trilogy, which I read repeatedly from 12 onwards, cemented my determination to become a medievalist. It used to be embarrassing to admit, but things are different now, thanks to film director Peter Jackson. Only in my 20s did I move to modernity. It was Berlin that seduced me. And I think it explains why Australians have such a great impact on current history insights. And it's with great pleasure, therefore, that Chris, may I invite you to give your lecture here tonight, how Europe went to war in 1914. With Professor Chris Clark. But I'd like, um, first of all, to thank the rector, Professor Luc Souter, for the, these very kind and generous words of introduction. I'd like to thank Jaap Janssen and the committee of the uh, Tanz Lecture for inviting me to, to this beautiful city. And um, I'm, I'd like to thank you all um, for being here uh, tonight in such numbers. I wanted to start with some images um, which will help us to revisit the events of the 28th of June, 1914, the events uh, which in a sense started the, the immediate cascade of crises that led to the outbreak of war in 1914. Of course, these events, the events of Sarajevo on the 28th of June will be familiar to most, if not all of you, but they have a kind of density, a sort of dramatic and semiotic density which repays revisiting them. They're always, it's always interesting to go back to them. There's so much going on on that eventful day. So I wanted to begin with a couple who I think it's fair to say are about to have a very bad day. 
that's Franz Ferdinand, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, sitting beside him. Uh, it's, it's not actually, uh, if truth be told, the morning of the assassination, it's the day before, so they're wearing different outfits and it's a different car, but um, they're sitting beside each other as they were on the 28th of June. He's Franz Ferdinand, the heir apparent to the Austrian throne. She's Sophie Hotek, the descendant of a very distinguished lineage of Czech or Bohemian nobility, not distinguished enough for the Habsburg royal family. Um, she, she was not regarded as being of sufficiently aristocratic or high aristocratic lineage to qualify as a member of the royal family in Vienna, for which reason she was never allowed, for example, to sit in the royal carriage with its golden wheels beside her husband when he was officiating in the capital. Um, and that's one reason why on that day, on the 28th of June, 1914, she did insist on sitting beside him because in Sarajevo, which was a relatively marginal place on the very edges of the vast, sprawling commonwealth of the Habsburg or the Habsburg monarchy, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, in that relatively peripheral location, she could sit beside him um, in a way that she could not have done, uh, you know, officiate with him in the way that she could not have done uh, in Vienna. There's another reason why she wanted to sit beside him um, throughout that day, and that is that 28th of June happened to be their wedding anniversary. And uh, this was a, by dynastic, st the standards of dynastic life at the time, uh, a relatively or a very tender and warm marriage. Not all dynastic marriages were like that, uh, but this one was. The 28th of June, unfortunately for them, also happened to be important for another reason. It was one of the red letter days in the Serbian, in the calendar of Serbian national memory, because it was the day of the defeat at Kosovo Polje, at the field of blackbirds in the year 1389, when Serbian forces, in fact, a mixed army of Serbs and other um, non-Serbian, including uh, Ottoman forces, fought a much larger Ottoman force and were defeated, bringing an end to the era of Serbian independence, the great empire of Tsar Dusan, um, the great medieval history of Serbia. And this recollection of a lost battle in, 13, in uh, 1389 was still very fresh in the minds of uh, of Serbs and Serbian nationalists, especially of young enthusiasts for the Serbian national cause. So this was a, a day, the, de the very date of this day was already charged with different meanings by the different participants in the uh, events of that day. And this is just a picture of um, Franz Ferdinand with his entourage arriving on the day of the, uh, of the, day of the visit to Sarajevo itself. Um, there's no trouble at this point, which is not surprising because virtually everybody in this picture is an Austrian official. But uh, they're in front, of, they're, they're not far from Sarajevo railway station. And um, as you can see, he's waving to everyone. I've included this picture because you can see uh, on it that he's wearing very gaudy, they're all wearing very gaudy green, gaudy green ostrich feathers. Now I know you can't tell they're green, you'll just have to take my word for it. It's a black and white photo, but uh, I can assure you they were green. And I'll be coming back to the gaudy green ostrich feathers uh, in a moment. Among other things, they made it very easy to recognize the Archduke on that day. Uh, the ostrich feathers could be seen above the heads of the crowd as the cars rolled along the Appel Quay. This is just a, a map of the Balkans. I've included this because I think one can never look too often at the map of the Balkans. It always repays re-looking because it's so complex and changing so fast in the last years before 1914 that simply, simply memorizing where everything is is quite difficult. I, I gave a talk, uh, it wasn't exactly this talk, but it was, a, it was on, on 1914, a different, from a different angle, and I showed a, an image of the Balkans, and I said this uh, at a talk I gave in Zagreb in Croatia, and I noticed everybody looking at me with a puzzled expression, and then I realized, of course, we were in the Balkans. Um, so they know exactly where everything is. That's the one place where everybody really does know um, where everything is. Um, but in any case, in Cambridge, you're endlessly having to remind British students of where these Balkan countries are. These are the, 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 the proverbial country, faraway countries of which we know little, as Chamberlain later uh, said, speaking of Czechoslovakia. Okay, so um, there, there, there is the Balkans. Now, I've included these two images. They're a bit like those twin images on the back of a cereal packet, a cornflakes packet, where you're asked to identify the 11 differences between two apparently identical pictures. And I mean, I, I, the, the differences are interesting. The most obvious one, and I'm not going to mention all of them, but the most obvious one is simply the, the obvious recession, the withdrawal of Ottoman um, imperial dominion between 1911 and 1914. This is a three-year period. 
and the Ottoman Empire, as you can see, is in a process of very swift collapse. And this swift collapse uh, destabilizes the geopolitics of the entire Balkan uh, region in all kinds of different ways, which we don't have time to go into. Another point about something that changes, well, you can see, incidentally, with a sort of inaudible plop, Albania suddenly appears in 1913. Um, but there's also the fact that Serbia increases in size. It becomes twice as big. And this is an imp a matter of some importance in the run-up to 1914, because in the course of the two wars, the two Balkan wars of 1912 and 1913, wars which today are largely forgotten, but were actually very traumatic and very bloody conflicts that extracted a huge toll in life and treasure. In the course of these two Balkan wars, Serbia uh, increased its, its, its surface area and its population by more than 100%. It more than doubled uh, both figures. And as a consequence, it became a more serious antagonist for Vienna. Um, the relationship between Serbia and Vienna was deteriorating um, from 1903, when there's a change of dynasty, um, right down to 1914. It was a very toxic relationship, plagued by prejudice and animosity on both sides. The Austrians were not innocent in this uh, poisoning of the mutual relationship between the two. Um, and, um, and, and, and as a consequence of the two wars, Serbia became a more serious factor, a factor to be reckoned with. And you can read this in all the military reports uh, from the military attaché uh, in Belgrade. The tone in 1912, 13, 14 is, we've got to take these people seriously. In earlier years, reporting on the Serbs had been very dismissive. People had said, these are, the Serbs are nothing more than naughty boys who are stealing apples from the Austrian orchard. Well, come 1913, and 1912 and 1913, when they see how swiftly a massive Serbian army is mobilized and how brilliantly the Serbs, the Serbs conduct their campaigns in both the Balkan Wars, uh, the reports change their tone. And they say, it's no longer sufficient to assume that we need one Austrian troop for every three Serbs. We're going to need one man for one man. These people have become a serious military and power political factor on the Balkans. And that also further stresses the situation um, for Austria. One last point. This, these dramatic changes between 1911 and 1914 basically force Austria to completely rethink its geopolitics, to rethink its security policy for the Balkan Peninsula. And come 1914, the policymakers in Vienna are still in a process of panicked reassessment and improvisation when they're surprised and shocked by the news of the assassinations at uh, Sarajevo. And without that background of change, instability, rapid flux, I think it's difficult to imagine the crisis at Sarajevo uh, cascading into a war in the way that it did. One last point about something that remains the same. And that's the location of Belgrade. Um, and the point I want to make there is simply that Belgrade, the capital city of the Kingdom of Serbia, is virtually in Austria-Hungary. It's a few minutes drive from the Austrian border. And that tells us something about the intimacy of this very difficult, this very toxic relationship. There were Serbs, of course, Serbia itself was largely inhabited by Serbs, though there are minorities in Serbia. Uh, but there are also Serbs in, in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Over 40% of the population of Bosnia-Herzegovina were Serbs. Uh, there were Serbs in the Vojvodina, in this area along here. And so there's a sort of Serbian diaspora, a larger Serbia, a larger ethnic Serbia, um, which exceeds the political, the political Serbia you can see on the map there. And that's part of the reason for the tension between these two states, because Serbian nationalism seeks the creation of a larger Serbian fatherland. And of course, there's nothing unusual in that. This is the default setting for Europeans. It's the Italians had sought to create an Italian fatherland through military action, through conflict. They achieved that in between 1859 and 1866. The Germans do the same between 1864 and 1871. Um, by 1912, 13, 14, it's the Serbs and the other Balkan states who are striving to build lasting, expanded nation states that will form a homeland for all their um, ethnic brothers and sisters. Okay, now this is the closest that the early 20th century got to Google Earth. <laughs> it's an, it's an, it's an, uh, an engraving from the, the, the wonderful Baedeker travel guides. Um, this is the travel guide to the Austro-Hungarian dominions and, and in brackets including the Balkan states. 
And um, this is their, their map of Sarajevo from the air, a sort of imagined aerial view. And I've included it really just to show you the structure of this town, which is organized around a river that runs through a valley, the River Miljatska, uh, a fairly swift running river, very beautiful and handsome city, um, built on the slopes that reach up from this river towards sort of what you wouldn't really call the mountains, but certainly high hills on either side. Um, the whole city is like a cupped hand, and this is what Sari Evans will always tell you. It's like a cupped hand, and between the two hands runs the River Miljatska, and it's along the river, along the Appel Quay, that the cars proceeded as they made their way uh, eastwards across the city towards the Rathaus, the um, city hall. Now, I've included this next image because it just expresses with brutal simplicity uh, what happened on the morning of the 28th of June. Um, I mean, it's fantastically clear, isn't it? As the, <laughs> as the cars were passing Chumuria Bridge, a young man by the name of Nedjelko Chabrinovic threw a, a bomb, or it's actually more like a grenade. He cracked the detonator, it had a chemical fuse. Uh, he cracked the detonator against a lamp post, which made a loud, loud sound like a gunshot. Um, and it's possibly on hearing this gunshot, thinking it was hearing this, this bang, that the driver of the second car in which Franz Ferdinand and his wife were sitting um, stepped on the accelerator instinctively, thinking someone was shooting at the car. And for that reason, the bomb didn't land inside the car, in which case it would have killed um, both the people in it, uh, along with the Landeschef, the governor of Bosnia, Herzegovina, Potjorek, who was sitting in the car with them, um, but rather hit the back of the car, rolled off it, and exploded under the third car, destroying the car and injuring the people in the car, along with uh, various bystanders, but killing nobody. I mean, there's a lot of blood, but nobody was lethally uh, in lethal danger. And uh, it, of course, it also gouged a hole in the road. Now, at this point, you might have thought it was time to cancel the visit to Sarajevo. You know, a bomb had been thrown, there'd been a loud bang, the third car was now a wreck, uh, and indeed it was proposed to Franz Ferdinand that, they, they, you know, that the, the, the city was clearly not safe, one should withdraw from Sarajevo and leave the town immediately. That's what would have happened if this, this had been a properly run security operation. But in fact, Franz Ferdinand said, don't be ridiculous, the man is clearly insane, have him taken to an asylum, we will continue as planned. Uh, despite the fact that his wife was bleeding from a very small uh, wound to her cheek, a little metal splinter had struck her on the face. Why did Franz Ferdinand do this? Well, part of the reason was that he was suffering from a syndrome, a medical syndrome, known technically as grumpy old man. Um, <laughs> it happens to a lot of us that as we get older, we get more and more irritated by less and less, and after all, having a bomb thrown at you is not a small thing. Um, so he was understandably irritated. Um, but he also was irritated by people telling him what to do. He didn't like that, and he wasn't having any, hearing any advice from any of the security people who had obviously failed in any case, because otherwise there wouldn't have been a bomb, uh, and so he insisted on going ahead as planned. What happened next um, had a, has a sort of comical edge to it, because, um, I mean, I've shown this picture partly just to remind you that Sarajevo was a Muslim city. It was uh, the, the city's government or administrative machine was in Muslim hands. It was run by Bosnian Muslims. And as you can see, all these, well, not all of them, but most of these dignitaries you see in the picture are wearing um, Muslim, Bosnian Muslim attire, the fezes being the most obvious marker of that. And this is in front of the city hall. Uh, among the men standing there on the stairs uh, with his hand raised is a man called Mehmet Cortic, the mayor, the Bosnian Muslim mayor of Sarajevo, to whom fell the unenviable task of welcoming the couple with a speech. Now, Cortic hated giving speeches. He was always very nervous. Uh, on public occasions, so he was already very nervous in any case. Uh, he'd had the speech printed out and, and glued onto a sort of wooden paddle, which he was holding in his hand, ready to read it out, trembling, no doubt. And then suddenly this bang was heard from down the street, uh, and the news reached him that a bomb had gone off, there had been an attack on the royal car, but they were coming anyway, he still had to give his speech. His speech was now totally inadequate to the situation, because it began with the words, it is with sentiments of the deepest joy that the citizens of Sarajevo welcome your highnesses to this beautiful city. I mean, you, it's, it's perfect speech on a good day, but it was no longer a good day. So he'd only got halfway through the first sentence when he was interrupted by Mr. Grumpy, who said, deepest joy, welcome. Is this how you welcome your guests with bombs? Uh, I mean, he had a point. At this point, his wife was seen uh, leaning towards him and whispering something to him, saying something very quietly. We don't know what it was, but um, I would suggest that it was probably something along the lines of, it's not his fault, dear, let him go on. Um, there are moments like this in every marriage. 
At this point, at this point, the Archduke said, very well, continue. And poor old Churchich continued with his speech. There was a reply from, well, there was supposed to be a reply immediately, but in fact, the text couldn't be found because it was, had been uh, left with his adjutant. Someone recovered the text, but the adjutant had been sitting in car, th in car three. So the text was now covered in blood. Um, so it had to be wiped and so on. You know, bloody blood everywhere. You know, you can imagine. It, it was not, well, things were not going well. So um, she met with some ladies. He, he, he chatted with some dignitaries. Um, observers commented that he was starting to show the signs of nervousness. He was probably in a sort of, you know, a, a minor form of shock. He was starting to get a bit jumpy, a bit nervous. He wanted to be, wanted the whole thing to be over with, which one can understand. And uh, so they went up to the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the um, balcony that overlooks the city. They looked briefly at the city. He said goodbye to everybody, and, th and then this picture we see here uh, happened. They made their way to the car, and I'm not going to go into the details of what happened next. You know, the, 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 someone forgot to tell the Czech driver that they were supposed to speed straight back down the Appel Quay. So the Czech driver turned, as you can see, into um, Franz Josef Street towards the Bazaar District, which they decided not to do, but nobody thought, this is a very Austrian problem, nobody had thought to tell the Czech driver in Czech that this was the plan. Um, and so the two first cars dr uh, pulled, to, pulled off to the right, and as they, which was the advertised route, incidentally, it sometimes said that it was a fantastic accident that Gavrilo Princip happened to be standing in front of Schiller's general store when the car drove by. It's not an accident at all. This was the advertised route, and um, Princip was waiting precisely for that uh, chance. And as it happens, he got a ch an even better chance than he expected, because just as the car passed Schiller's restaurant, uh, Schiller's general store, um, the, the, uh, the uh, Count Harach, the bodyguard, screamed at the driver, you idiot. He used actually rather stronger words, but I won't repeat them here. He, he screamed, at the, screamed at the driver, you idiot, haven't you been told we've changed the route? Reverse and get back into the Appel Key. We're going back down there. At this point, the car pulled to a complete stop in order to go into reverse. And there is a picture of what happened next. Now, this is a, a highly fanciful image. What we see here is like a scene from an opera. The couple are rising up out of the car, and he's singing, I die, and she's singing, I die, and so on. But in fact, nothing like this actually happened. The couple remained completely uh, motionless. Why? Because the bullets had struck them in so effectively, him in the jugular and a major vein in his neck, her in a huge vein in her abdomen, that she was already comatose by the time she slid sideways and her head landed in his lap. Count Harach, in fact, who was standing on the running board, though in Austrian fashion he was standing on the wrong side of the car, so he couldn't do anything about the attack, um, and he's seen running round from the side. In fact, the whole picture is the wrong, wrong way round. He fired from the other side, but he fired from about as close as you see this young man firing. And uh, Count Harach was unaware that they'd been hit until the car pulled back. And as it stopped again and drove down the Appel Quay, he saw her teetering over and, and him asking her, was she all right? And then he saw blood issuing from his mouth, from the Archduke's mouth. And uh, at this point, he heard, her, heard him saying to her words which would become famous throughout the world over the next 24 hours, the words, Zofal, Zofal, stirb mir nicht, bleib am Leben für unsere Kinder. Sophie, Sophie, don't die, stay alive for our children. Uh, as I say, it was a very tender family with a rather romantic, emotional life. And uh, these words subsequently transformed the reputation of this man, who was not a particularly, I mean, being uh, Mr. Grumpy, as I've described, he was not a particularly popular or charismatic figure. He was not a crowd pleaser. But um, when the news of these words became known, and lots of other private details about their life together and their family life in general became known through the media, through the immense media hype, that followed these murders, the man was transformed. And there's a, a, an immense wave of media-generated emotion. It doesn't mean this emotion is inauthentic, but it was mediated by, and to some extent created by, the Austrian media. And Karl Kors, who understood the mechanisms of media representation better than anyone else, possibly in the world at that time, but certainly in Vienna, said that what was silent in his life has become eloquent through his death. <clears throat> One last detail on that, one last point on that picture is, of course, one thing is very right about the picture, and that is the, the minarets in the background. There were over 100 mosques in Sarajevo. It was one of the capitals, one of the beautiful centers of European Islam. Now, this is a photo which is often captioned in history books as the arrest of Gavrilo Princip. It would have been astonishing, given the state of t photographic technology in 1914, if someone had managed to get a snapshot like this of the actual arrest of the man after the unforeseen event 
on the 28th, the morning of the 28th of June. In fact, it's the arrest of another man called Fyodor Beer a couple of days later as part of a police dragnet. And the photographer was in fact warned by the police, we're going to make an arrest in such and such street, why didn't you come along, you can get a good picture. So he came along and he got what has to, it has to be said is a fantastic picture. It's not a picture of Princip's arrest, but the journalist in question had a fantastic idea, a sort of million dollar idea. It occurred to him, why not, get, uh, once he developed the picture, why not take this picture and market it as a photo of the arrest of Princip? So he changed the caption, the arrest of Gorilla Princip, and made a fortune. That's the last time that a journalist has ever behaved like that. <laughs> okay, so, but what's interesting about this picture, it's not telling us what it claims to be telling us, it's not telling us what it looked like when Princip was arrested, but it is telling us something, like all visual evidence, uh, there's always truth in the source somewhere, if you know how to find it. And what this source is actually telling us is something else, which is, that when, as this young man is being arrested, he's not just being arrested, he's being protected. He's being protected from angry, angry Muslim citizens who are furious at the Serbs for their involvement in this uh, assassination. In fact, Fyodor Bear was not a Serb, he was a German, but he was a, 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 a suspected of having been involved in the background to this plot against um, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. He was later uh, released. And here's a picture of the young man who took the two fatal shots. He and Nedjelko Chabrinovic were the two most active commandos. There were seven young men in all in Sarajevo on that day. I won't go into the details of how the group was put together. That in itself is an interesting story. But um, Gavrilo, uh, Gavrilo Princip and, um, and, and his friend Nadjelko Chabrinovic, along with their friend Trivko Grabej, were the three members of the seven-man group who had actually recently been in Serbia. They'd been trained uh, in marksmanship in a park outside um, Belgrade by, with, the, by, with the assistance of members of Serbian, of a member of Serbian military intelligence, someone also affiliated with a group called Ujedinjenjeli Smrt, Union or Death, also known as the Black Hand. Um, they'd been provided with guns and bombs by um, individuals associated with this network. But it must be said, although, you know, um, Chavrinovic called himself a terrorist uh, during the, the court depositions during the court case, the court hearings, which took place later that year in October 1914. Uh, although he used about himself the word Staatsterrorist, state terrorist, um, we have to be, I think, careful about using the term terrorists about these young men, especially if by terrorist we mean someone who delights in carnage, in murder, the murder of men, women, and children in marketplaces or department stores, uh, the kinds of things we associate with terrorism today. These are actually quite tender-hearted young men. Um, when Gavrilo Princip was read, when it was, when the words of the Archduke to his wife, um, you know, Zofal Zofal Stirp Minicht, um, were read out in the, in the, um, in the court um, during the proceedings, um, Princip, for example, burst into tears. And when he was asked, you know, why are you, why are you upset? He said, I'm not a beast. Uh, and that was true of all of them. They were not, um, they were not natural born killers. They were young men very poor in experience, as young people tend to be, in a, in a wonderful, I mean that in a wonderful and positive way to the young people in the room, um, but rich in ideals. Um, and that can be a wonderful thing. It's one of the wonderful things about being young, but of course it's also something which, which makes it easy for, for irredentists and extremist movements to prey on young people, especially when they feel, as Princip certainly did, under-respected by the, the male uh, role models in their own lives. He had a very tormented relationship with his father and also with, his, with the male teachers at his various schools. And this actually is a theme that runs through the lives of all these young men, is that in some sense they'd sort of fallen foul of the, of the key male figures in their own lives. And what happened to them when they went to Serbia um, was that they were groomed by sophisticated older men who, who, who gave them a sense that they could do something meaningful and worthwhile, that they, they could make something of themselves by giving themselves to an immortal and beautiful cause. I want to throw myself, what is it? I want to burn like a candle for my people, was what Bogdan Jeraic, the, uh, the man, a man who'd taken, tried to kill the Croat police chief of Bosnia Herzegovina, had written in his diary in 1910. And Jeraic was one of the heroes of the seven men who gathered in Sarajevo on the 28th of June. That's a picture of some of the other, um, the other um, conspirators. I should add, by the way, that as you've probably seen already, that Gavrilo Princip was not in a good state of health by the time he carried out the assassination. He was su suffering quite seriously from tuberculosis. And when the, the judge, the German judge, Leo Pfeffer, who interrogated him during those very hot um, days of, of June 19, June and early July 1914, uh, 
When Leo Pfeffer saw him for the first time, he wrote in his report, he was such a fine, fine and fragile looking young man, it was hard to imagine him having been guilty of such an appalling crime. Uh, there's a great sort of irony about this relationship between Leo Pfeffer, the interrogating judge, and Gavrilo Princip. Princip, of course, died a few years later in Theresienstadt Fortress, which would later become the core of the Theresienstadt concentration camp, and Leo Pfeffer was killed in the Theresienstadt concentration camp as a Jew during the Holocaust, in the next war to follow. Dragucin Dmitrievich, also known as Arpis, um, there he is in a characteristically conspiratorial pose. I mean, he's really performing here for the camera um, with a couple of close friends, as you can see. Um, and he's the man who really masterminded the, the, the group known as Union or Death, founded in 1911 um, from sort of circles associated with the regicide of the uh, Obrenovich, Obrenovich dynasty in 1903. Um, very, um, again, you know, in many ways you might call them patriots, freedom fighters, uh, but they were running an underground organization which was only really very partially under the control uh, or overview of the government. Um, this is an important point. Arpis was not really, although he was part of the Serbian state, he was not or did not behave in a way that suggested he was answerable to um, the Serbian state. And certainly um, he was not in the, under the control of the Serbian prime minister, Nikola Pašić, who found it impossible to interdict his activities. Although Pašić and other cabinet ministers in Belgrade were aware that Arpis and his people were running uh, guns and bombs and young men across the borders with the assistance of parts of the Serbian uh, customs organization that were affiliated with the Black Hand. Although Pasic knew these things, there was nothing, he felt, nothing that he could do um, to, 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 to um, roll up, to suppress these activities by his own um, military intelligence um, organization. Okay, so there I think um, that's as much as I wanted to, to do by way of revisiting those, those events on the 28th of June. And I wanted from there to go on just to remind you of something you know already, which is on, the, on that morning, the morning of the 28th of June, 1914, when Sophie Kotek and Franz Ferdinand arrived in Sarajevo, Europe was at peace. And if you'd asked the statesmen of that era um, whether they expect, thought that a, a major conflagration, a continental war was likely in the near future, then all of them, I think, I can't think of any exception, would have told you that in, re in the last 18 months or two years, war had actually been getting less likely rather than more likely, a major war. Uh, why would they have said that? Well, because uh, the two, above all, because the two Balkan wars had come and gone without triggering a European conflagration. And this is a point that Margaret Macmillan has made, that the sort of drumbeat of repeated crises before 1914, rather than reminding people, making them alert to the danger of a major um, conflict, had the opposite effect. It numbed people, it deadened their awareness of danger, uh, because crises seemed to come and go um, as crises often do. And there's a warning in this, of course, uh, for us today, not to, not, never, as it were, to cease being vigilant in the face of political crisis. And we have the eloquent testimony of Arthur Nicholson, a senior functionary in the British Foreign Office, permanent undersecretary uh, in the British Foreign Office in London, who comments in a letter to a colleague uh, in May 1914, since all the years that I've been at the Foreign Office, I have never seen such calm international waters. So this is not one of the starry hours of diplomatic prognosis. But 37 days after the visit, Europe is of course at war and the world war that unfolds from that war um, has I think with justice been described as the primary catastrophe of the 20th century. Now I know this term is now controversial. It's not a primary catastrophe for everybody. It's not for the Poles, for example. Poland is reborn in this war. Um, and so we have to bear in mind that there are many perspectives on this vast conflict, as one would expect. It's not really a primary catastrophe for Australia. For Australia, it's the sort of founding act of the nation state. Australia only exists as a nation state from 1901 when it's confederated. Up until then, it was just a, a bunch of separate colonies all ruled independently from London. Now it's a nation state and entering this war is the first political act of national unity. It's the the baptism of fire, as it was often called in the Australian press at the time and afterwards in the interwar period. So for Australia, I think, despite the very high mortalities among the, the, those who volunteer to fight in the fields of Belgium, northern France, uh, Mesopotamia, northern Africa, and so on, despite all of that, um, for the Australians too, it's not really a primary catastrophe. Nevertheless, 
If we think about all the poison and dislocation that is fed into the world system by this war, then I think the term primary catastrophe or primal catastrophe is, is, is justified. This war destroyed four world empires, the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Russian Empire, and the German Empire. It consumed the lives of at least 10 million young men on its many fields of uh, battle. It accounted for between 15 and 20 million wounded, and by this I mean seriously wounded men, lightly wounded men were never counted, um, but you have vast numbers of seriously wounded men, and people of my age in Australia all remember from their childhood older men, relatives, friends of the family, who were still carrying these, the effects of these wounds with them and still would, and the trauma also of the First World War, and would continue to do so uh, until the end of their lives. <clears throat> and so I think Fritz Stern is right when he refers to this war as the disaster, the calamity from which all the other calamities of the 20th century sprang. It's very difficult to imagine the rise of fascism in Italy without this war, difficult to imagine the October Revolution in the Russian Empire, virtually impossible in fact, it's very easy to imagine something like the February Revolution of 1917, which virtually everybody had predicted. You know, a collapse of Tsarism, a takeover of power by a, a coalition of nationalist and centrist groups um, in the, from the Russian Duma, uh, supported by other extra-parliamentary elements. But the October Revolution carried out by the Bolsheviks and the creation thereafter of a one-party state of a kind that had never been seen in world history, none of that had been predicted and nor was it, is it possible to imagine without the titanic stresses brought to bear on, German soci on uh, Russian society uh, by this war, and to which, of course, we have to add the fact that Lenin and his assistants and his entourage are, as it were, injected, funneled into uh, Russia in a secret train in the very hope that the bacillus of revolution will infect the ailing Russian state. And finally, it's hard to imagine German history taking the disastrous turn into darkness that it takes in the 20th century without the extraordinary effects of this war on German society. I don't have time to go into that, but I think the rise and the seizure of power of the Nazi movement, the National Socialist movement, and also thereby, uh, as a consequence, the Holocaust, are very difficult to imagine in a world which hasn't already been blighted by this conflict. So I think my former Cambridge colleague, Adam Tooze, who's now gone to, uh, going to Columbia, he was at, he's, he's at Yale now, but he's moving to Columbia, is right when he speaks of the book is in, in the book that he's just written, The Deluge, um, of this war as having unhinged the global system. Um, and he goes into all the different ways in which that happens. And I don't have time to go into that now, but I think it really is a catastrophic uh, event that poisons um, the century that follows. So the question, it follows from all that, that the question of how this war came about um, attracts a certain intrinsic interest. And I don't want to disappoint you, but I'm not the first person to have noticed this. It's, uh, this is an old debate. Uh, in fact, in some respects, it's older than the war itself, because the argument over who was responsible for bringing this war into the world began before the first shots were fired. And it's striking how many of the arguments, even the most sophisticated ones, that we find in the secondary literature on this war, you could already find on the lips of the statesman who brought this war about. A man called John W. Langdon, an American historian, did a count uh, in 1991 in a book he published with the Oxford University Press. That's the only time this evening I'll mention Oxford. Um, but he did a book, he did a book um, with a certain university press called The Long Debate, and the title is in, a way, um, is in a way the thesis of the book. And in this book he said, he, he didn't bother counting all the publications, but he said there, if, you, if you're interested in how many books and articles in English you really have to read in order to master this topic, then that's 25,000. So that gives you a sense of the size of, of what he regarded as the kind of core literature on this subject. Uh, and of course, a lot of books have appeared since then. Um, Rebecca West, the great um, British novelist, um, who wrote, in my view, one of the deepest reflections on the place of the Balkans in 20th century European history. She was someone who loved the Balkans and the peoples of the Balkan Peninsula very much. Um, she traveled to Sarajevo in 1937 to see the places where the, the crises, the sort of sequence of crises began that brought the war about. When she, this is when she was researching for her sort of mega book, um, Black Lamb, Grey Falcon, a kind of mix of personal reportage, history, um, travel log, um, diary, and so on. And while she was in the city, she went to the balcony of the city hall, um, the place where Franz Ferdinand had taken his last look over the, this very handsome city, and she turned to her husband and she said, I shall never understand how it all happened. It's not that we know too little, it's that we know too much. 
And that was in 1937. Well, of course, today we know a hell of a lot more. So the question then arises, why add yet another book to the pyramid of paper that already exists on this subject? And of course, as you can imagine, my colleagues at Cambridge were very swift to pose this question while I was working on the book. Um, you know, I was constantly being asked, why are you doing a book on this subject? Surely this has been done to death. You know, um, there can be nothing more left and it's been squeezed out like a lemon uh, and so on. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about one's colleagues, perhaps at, perhaps at Cambridge in particular, that just as you're struggling with the, with the cruelties of a really difficult problem, they come up with excellent reasons why you should curl up and die. <laughs> of course, one has to find an answer to these taunts. Um, <clears throat> and my answer was and is, that yes, the debate is old and the books are numerous, but although the debate is old, the subject is still fresh. In fact, in many ways, the subject is fresher today than it was when I first encountered it in the 1970s as a schoolboy in Sydney. When I first um, discovered this topic at high school, it's one of the central topics of Australian secondary education. You know, it's a very important war for us too, after all. Uh, and when I first encountered this topic, a lot of period charm had accumulated around the events of 1914. This was Europe's last summer, to borrow the title of David Fromkin's book. There was a lot of tennis and gin and tonic. Um, when one read the books by Barbara Tuckman, fantastic narrative histories, which I recommend to everyone, by the way, they're still, they're full of really profound historical reflection. But nevertheless, when one read the, her books, The Proud Tower and The Guns of August, one was struck by the loving detail with which she described uniforms, beautiful, gaudy uniforms, you know, ostrich feathers, um, court etiquette, the, all the rules about where babies were allowed to be presented at court, for example, in which order did the prams have to be presented. Um, the, there's a wonderful little vignette about Lord Salisbury riding to the House of Commons on a tricycle, which he had built himself. Um, a tricycle with pneumatically tired wheels. It was the first pneumatically tired tricycle in all London. He was understandably excited. He was being pushed by his valet, James, he had to be pushed because the thing had no pedals on it. Um, <laughs> but the point is, as one read all these details, the ornamentalism, as David Canadine would call it, the ornamentalism of this world of 1914, of the pre what we now think of as the pre-war, though, of course, we must never forget, the people of the pre-war did not know they were of the pre-war. Um, the, the, as one you know, encountered all the ornamentalism of this world, the assumption stealthily asserted itself that these must be bygone people, people of, a, of another era, people who had nothing in common with us, that if their helmets and hats had gaudy green ostrich feathers on them, then perhaps their thoughts and arguments and dreams also had green ostrich feathers. In other words, that they had nothing to say to us, the link between them and us, that the, the bond had been torn forever. And yet if we think again or look back at the events of the 28th of June from our perspective, the perspective of people in the not quite beginning 21st century, then it seems to me one has exactly the opposite feeling. One can't help but be struck by the raw modernity of the events, their raw contemporaneity. Uh, if you look at, if you run through your mind the events uh, on the Apple Key, the cavalcade of automobiles, no prancing horses, no carriages, just motor cars, then you can't help but have at the back of your head the images of November 1963 in Dallas. If you think of the fact that the story begins with a squad of suicide bombers, and these young men were suicide bombers in a very literal sense. They were carrying not just guns and bombs, but also potassium cyanide, with which they'd been instructed to take their own lives as soon as they'd carried out their um, mission. And behind these young men were underground networks, obliquely linked to uh, a nation state entity, to the uh, Kingdom of Serbia, to the Belgrade government, very loosely and obliquely linked, but not of the government, not, not, not as it were equatable with the government itself, only loosely connected to any sovereign entity, very hard to pin down, very hard to trace, no, no paper trail, no membership lists, operating in small cells, uh, often largely ignorant of each other's activities. So, there are features of this story which are actually familiar aspects, familiar in our own um, political scenery. And our compass has shifted or changed in other ways as well. If we think about how the Yugoslav wars of the 1990s reminded us of the power of Balkan nationalism, we're less inclined now to simply to airbrush the Balkans out of the scene. It's a very striking feature of much of the literature on 1914 on the origins of the First World War that the Balkans are scarcely visible. Uh, and it seemed to me that the 1990s were a reminder that we needed to 
um, look, more more, look more closely at the question of where they fit in uh, to the larger story. And then there's the fact that the, wo the world we inhabit um, is no longer the world of the post-Cold War, dominated by one, the only superpower left standing, the United States. The unipolar world of post-1989 has now given way to the post-post-Cold War, as George Friedman has called it. Sorry, I can't think of anything more picturesque, but that's his, those are his words. The po in the post-post-Cold War, we're back in, the, in an era of genuine multipolarity, with a wearying a uh, titan, or a weary titan, growing steadily more and more tired of its global role, feeling overextended, like London in 1914, now it's Washington in 2014, with rising, a rising power that is challenging the existing global order, and I'm not talking about Russia, and with numerous regional crises that seem to rage on out of control, creating the space for the emergence of new and potentially destabilizing regional players who are all in a competition to expand their own local and regional uh, purchase, their own local and regional leverage. And these shifts in perspective, which in, in other words, the point is that this, the world we're in now is in, is in some ways much more like the world of 1914. So even as 1914 recedes into the, into the past, which it has to do, it has no choice but to do that. On the other hand, it speaks to us more and more freshly because the world we're in is more and more like that world. And these shifts in perspective, it seems to me, prompt us to rethink the story of how war uh, came to Europe in 1914. And accepting that challenge emphatically does not mean embracing a kind of vulgar presentism, a présentisme, as uh, François Artaud has called it, that, rem that, that remakes the past simply to meet the needs of the present. Rather, it means acknowledging those features of the past which before we couldn't see because our standpoint was different, but of which we now have a better view thanks to the change in our perspective, the change in our vantage point. I think this is one of the things that keeps history alive, that the present is always changing, and so it's as if we're, we're, we're contemplating a huge and immensely complex building, a very complex edifice, and when we move, even a few footsteps, we can see aspects of that structure that were hidden to, from us before. And what we have to do is try and integrate um, these new perspectives, these new insights, into our understanding. Bearing all of this in mind, how does one go about refreshing the narrative? And I want to, in the last few minutes, just to touch on a few points about that. The first thing that I tried to do to make the narrative fresher for me, and I, I hope for, the, for readers, was uh, rather than trying to find a different answer to the question, why was there a war between 1914 and 1918, um, to try changing the question. I mean, this is something you can do if you're uh, an historian. You can try uh, either t you know, play around with the answer or you can play around with the question. And I think changing the question is in some ways a bit better than playing around with the answer because playing around with the answer involves already deciding that you know what the answer is. But the fact is, with a complex problem like the outbreak of 1914, you shouldn't even start, embark on research, it seems to me, if you already know the answer. There's no point. So the idea was to change the question. And instead of asking the question, why did this war come, to ask, how did it come? Now, you might object to that, that questions of how and why are, are not really separable. They're inextricably linked. But questions about why lead us in a, in a particular direction, they pull us in search of causes. So we look for large, by causes we mean large categorical words, nationalism, the rise of, the rise of uh, social Darwinism, the, um, the phenomenon of arms races, um, Imperialism is another favorite one. And so as you trawl through the decades before 1914, you collect all these causes and you pile them up, one on top of each other. And finally, the scale begins to tilt from a possible war to a probable war to an inevitable war. And the, the, the causal pressure seems so great, there's no room left for the people who made the decisions that actually brought this war into the world. They are squeezed out of the field of vision. What we have is causes that are already in place, a war that has to happen that is inevitable. And yet some of the most interesting writing on this wall, on this war has made the exact opposite point. I'm thinking of Holger Aflerbach's book, The Improbable War, question mark, where he makes the point in his introductory essay that in many ways war was getting less likely before it got more likely. There is no linear accumulation of causation. There's no linear accumulation of pressure for war. The outbreak of war is not like the eruption of a volcano. The eruption of a volcano is a natural event. It really is the consequence of the accumulation of pressures. But the, the outbreak of a war is a political event. 
It's the consequence of choices. People have to choose to take a world or a country from peace into war. And I was interested in those choices and how they came about. Asking the question how leads us in a different direction. But before I come to that, one more point about the problem with why questions. And that's a point that's made by a Bulgarian historian of the Balkan Wars who remarks in the introduction to his book, and I quote, when we ask the question why, uh, guilt soon becomes the focal point. So in other words, when we ask why, what we often mean is who. Who brought this terrible war into the world? And the answer that's often been found to that question um, is the Germans. Germany brought the war into the world. Europe was a nice, peaceful place. There was a psychopath star state that brought a war, uh, deliberately caused the war, planned the war in advance. That was the argument made by um, Fritz Fischer, John Roel, my colleague in Britain, still making it today, uh, that the Germans didn't just start the war, they actually planned it in advance. And on those occasions when they actually didn't cause a war, they were, in his words, merely postponing it. Um, so you have a kind of a moment where, a, a, a view of the world where world history is being controlled from Berlin. Uh, that's what happens when you build a narrative around the idea of blame, when you look for a culprit and then try and find out how this culprit caused, did this terrible thing. Where's all the, where's all the Beweismaterial? You gather all the proofs and they tend to come from the German archives. Fritz Fischer um, didn't look at any other archives. He was only interested in Germany. He was a very fine histori historian, but he was only interested in Germany. Uh, but of course, it's not simply not possible to explain the outbreak of a war that involved so many states by reference only to the sources in one state. So I wanted to get away from that blame-based approach, which takes us in the direction of a culprit or a potential a suspect, and instead ask the question how, uh, an approach which takes you on a different journey through the events that uh, made war more likely, the places in which risk accumulated, so you're looking at where risks are accumulating, where mechanisms are being put in place, pieces of causality that may be, that may be, um, being, that may be occurring not uh, in, in accordance with an intended, with a plan or some kind of long laid intention, but may simply be accumulating for all kinds of other reasons, partly by accident, partly um, because intentions and consequences uh, never end up being entirely commensurate. So that was the idea, to change um, the, the focus in that way, and that does not mean excluding questions of responsibility. In the end, you do have to face the question of responsibility for the outbreak of this war. Um, but it involved trying to get the questions about why out of the answers to the questions about how, rather than the other way around. Okay, so a couple more points about how, one, how I tried to sort of refresh the narrative, and I just want to make a couple of very brief points here uh, about the book, and then I'll close. The first was, you know, like all historians do, I tried to capture trends in the literature. Now, this is one of the most interesting literatures in the history of historical writing. It has captured the interest of some of the best you know, brains working on history. So there are just hundreds upon hundreds of really excellent books by colleagues alive and dead. So you can actually get a lot done simply by reading and reading and reading and then building new constellations from the arguments that are there in the literature, trying to make sense of arguments that have been perhaps underexposed, have received not enough credit, need, need more attention to connect old arguments with the latest impulses in the, in the uh, research, and so on and so forth. And one of the most interesting things that's been happening in the research on 1914 has been the kind of globalization of the field of vision. We used to think of 1914 as caused by the polarization of Europe into alliances. Uh, I was taught at school that the, the two alliance systems emerged because the Germans behaved so provocatively that the other states unified against them. Then the Germans got upset because they felt encircled, but it was all their fault anyway. And um, Europe got more and more polarized, and so on. I remember my teacher holding up his hand. He was a fantastic teacher, incidentally, and no disrespect to him. And the fact that I remember this lesson is a testimony to his skills. And I think anybody in this room who's studying history um, probably owes this interest to the encounter with a very interesting and charismatic teacher. But in any case, this guy stood up and he held up his hand and he said, if you get a question on the outbreak of the First World War, he held up his hand like this. He said, just remember the five German provocations, right? <laughs> ships, they built ships. They shouldn't have built ships. That makes the British angry. They, they challenged the French in Morocco. You should never challenge the French in, French in France. They're really sensitive about that. They don't like that. They supported the Austrians over the annexation of Bosnia-Herzegovina. That was a bad idea because it irritated the Russians, which you should never do. 
Then they challenged the French again in Northern Africa. They hadn't learned their lesson, and then they issued Austria with the blank check of support on the 5th and 6th of July, 1914. I mean, as a piece of pedagogy, that is superb, and I remember it to this day. And I, incidentally, I use it in my exam, and I did very well, thank you very much. But, <laughs> but the point is, the point is that um, you know, the, the view of the, these events now is, is much broader. We don't think of this simply as a question of how what French people thought, or what French leaders thought about German leaders and the Anglo-German antagonism. There's now a vast literature, or a growing literature in any case, on the long-term tensions between Britain and Russia, the importance of the uh, two world empires, which were experiencing tension all the way along their periphery, in Tibet, in China, um, in the Far East. There's um, a great deal of interest in the role of Japan in the background to 1914. There's an interest in the rise of the China question, the increasing importance of China, an area which brought the European great powers increasingly into tension with each other because that was an area of competition. It was the new great game, as it were. Uh, what used to happen in Central Asia was now happening on the bridgeheads, the European bridgeheads of China. Um, and these bridgeheads, of course, had a, tum a cataclysmic effect on the domestic life of uh, the Chinese Empire, as you all know, the Boxer Rebellion and so on. And so uh, we sort of de-Europeanized, we provincialized Europe to some extent, um, which I think is a very good thing. But I also tried, in addition to taking account of those kinds of new trends in the literature, I also tried to, to, to make sense of aspects of the story which it seemed to me had been underexposed. And one of them is the extremely chaotic character of decision-making before 1914. And I just here want to give you a couple of examples. Consider the fact that during the tenure in office of Sir Edward Grey, the British Foreign Secretary in London, no fewer than 16 French foreign ministers came and went from office. And two of them came and went twice, which is really quite an achievement. <laughs> There's a, there was, a, before 1914, a kind of Heisenbergian uncertainty about the location of power in these complex executive apparatuses. Um, no one, the, the dispatches were full of reports, or questions rather. What, what the, the one question diplomats were expected to answer was, who is actually running the show? Who's making policy? And the answer was often, well, I'm not sure. Last week it seemed to be the military. This week it's the Tsar. The Minister of War seems to be very important this morning. Uh, tomorrow it may be the, the, the Foreign Minister and so on. So there's a kind of chorus of dissident voices which are often competing with each other. And often it, it, it doesn't seem to make sense to speak of a Russian foreign policy or a Russian Balkan policy. You're looking at so many different agents with so many different policies. And the same thing applies in Austria-Hungary, which has got a hive-like structure where all kinds of people can feed into the decision-making process. So that, of course, was important before 1914 because it grossly increased the opacity, the untransparency of the system, the unpredictability, and thereby made the system much more prone to crisis. And incidentally, I don't think this is a problem that's gone away. Perhaps we could talk about that later. Um, a further point, to pick up moments in the sort of chain of events that led to 1914 um, that have been, again, underexposed or underweighted, received le you know, less weight and less attention than they should have. And one of those was the Italian war on Libya, which broke out in 1911, when the Italians, without any provocation whatsoever, attacked what we now call Libya, three integral provinces of the Ottoman Empire called Fezzan, Cyrenaica, and Tripolitania. Um, it was a very bloody war. It involved numerous atrocities, which were widely reported on in the European press. Um, it was also the first war ever to see aerial bombardments, um, bombs thrown from planes. It was fairly homespun technology by today's standards. The pilot had to clutch the bomb between his knees. He had to prime it by hand with a fuse um, activate the fuse and then throw the bomb again by hand while maintaining control of his machine. Um, so it was a fairly adventurous business. But there were also dirigibles, airships, which had racks on which you could, um, on which you could store up to 250 of these bombs and they were thrown by trained bomb throwers and their effect on the Turco arabic troops, as they were then called, on the ground, the people we had now called ground troops, that the term then didn't exist, um, was predictably dramatic. So it was an important war from that point of view, but it was a very important milestone too on the way to 1914 because the war on Libya, the war on the Ottoman Empire in Northern Africa flashed a green light to the Balkan states, Serbia, Montenegro, Romania, Greece, Bulgaria. This is the moment to get what you want from the Ottoman Empire. Without the Italian attack on Libya, the two Balkan wars could not have happened. And I wanted to um, bring this event, this episode, into the picture as well, because of course it's an event that comes 
completely out of the blue. It has nothing to do with Fritz Fischer's psychogram of the German elites, which is actually quite an, an accurate portrait of what some of these people are thinking in Berlin. But, of course, the Italian war on Libya was not encouraged by the, the planners in Berlin or the policymakers in Berlin. The Germans and the Austrians were appalled at the news of the Italian war because they knew exactly that this would destabilize the Balkans. The Austrians were horrified. They were not consulted. The ones who were egging the Italians into this war were the French and the British, who were delighted to see, it, to, to see Italy um, take its share of the colonial pickings in northern Africa. Uh, Edward Gray explicitly urged them to do it, and sooner rather than later. And there are lots of other ways in which one can uh, try and change the picture. But I want to, and I want to close now, simply by saying that it gets very hard once you've walked these paths and you've thought about the war from these different perspectives. It gets very hard to fit your mind back into the stringencies of the Fisher thesis, a, a one-state thesis, which which makes one state. Uh, he claimed to be speaking about primary responsibility for the war, but in practical terms, since Fisher never has anything to say about anyone else's responsibility, he really meant sole responsibility. And John Royal has made, I think, that case even more explicit um, when he says that 20 Germans started, uh, planned and started the First World War. It was 20 men, and they were all German. Um, and it gets harder and harder, I think, once you think in this wider frame about the events that brought war in 1914 to return to the simplicities of the sort of unipolar the blame thesis. There's no question about the appeal of the blame game. Dishing out blame gives pleasure. It gives a kind of moral pleasure to the one, not to the one who's getting the blame, incidentally. <laughs> Being blamed is not very pleasurable at all, but blaming others is a very pleasurable activity. But the problem is, uh, the problem is not, and this I want, really want to stress this, the problem is not that you might end up blaming the wrong party. Because frankly, it doesn't matter if we blame the Russians. If you're in the business of blaming, it doesn't matter which state you blame. Neil Ferguson has even been brilliant and perverse enough to blame the British for starting the First World War. Although he's in a sort of school of one, I think, on that. But um, the, the Russians have been blamed recently by Sean McMeekin. The French have been blamed in a number of studies. Of course, the Germans are still the most popular. But, um, you know, there's also a small group of, uh, well, there's also Fritz Fellner who made a great case. He was furious at the Germans for blaming themselves. He said, what about us? What about the Austrians? Surely we have a place in this. You know, we're the ones who waged war on Serbia. You know, what is it with these Germans? They give us nothing. They don't even give us the blame. <laughs> Share the blame around. So, um, so I have to revise what I just said. Sometimes being blamed does give pleasure. I've noted that noticed, that, noticed that recently in Germany, that sometimes if you try and take away just part of someone's blame, uh, there are places where that, that itself can cause pain. Um, in any case, the point is not that you might end up blaming one state. The problem is simply that um, in seeking a villain, in looking for a single culprit, you're just going to lose from view. You'll, you'll, you'll um, exclude from the field of vision the intensely interactive quality of this war. Um, because this, the story of how this war came about, and this is where I'm going to close, um, I was at a paper a little while ago and somebody kept on saying, you know, in conclusion, in conclusion, finally said, you're probably wondering why I keep on saying in conclusion. I say in conclusion to keep hope alive. Um, but anyway, I really am concluding. This is not just to keep your hope alive. Um, in conclusion, I would say that the story of how this war came about uh, was not a James Bond movie, right? We don't find at the end of this story a sort of mountain hideaway with velvet jacketed villains you know, stroking a white cat with a steel prosthetic hand and saying, no, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Um, this is, an in, it, it, it's, it's not that kind of story. It's not an Agatha Christie murder mystery in which at the end of the story we're going to find the vicar with a blood-stained swordfish standing beside the prone corpse of Lady Carrington in the conservatory. Um, it's not that kind of story. It, it, was, it was intensely interactive. It was complex. In fact, I think the crisis of, 19, of the summer of 1914 was the most complex event of modern times, uh, quite possibly of any times. I'm just be being a modest person. I want to confine my claim to modernity. But um, nevertheless, I think probably it is the most complex event of any time. It was um, genuinely interactive, genuinely multipolar and multivectoral, and finally, and most importantly, genuinely European. This was a European disaster. You can call it a tragedy if you like. It was a European disaster a European cataclysm, and it needs to be studied and understood in a genuinely continental way. It was, it was brought about by a gallery of political actors who shared a fundamentally similar and European political culture. And it was to illuminate those aspects of how war came in 1914 that I wrote this book. Thank you very much for coming tonight.
Thank you very much, Professor Clark. I think this was a really impressive uh, lecture. Would you agree that we have a absolutely half an hour at least for some questions? I'm sure there are many. So you, there is a mic here. You can sit here. Have a seat here. And let's go for this um, set of questions. So who might, can I ask the floor? Please raise your hand, and then Jacques will try to get there. I, I start here for backwards. Turn around, okay? okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for a riveting and funny talk. Uh, just one question. Isn't the question of visiting all of the, uh, all of the choices and who made those choices, isn't it also tantamount to apportioning blame? It is a more nuanced apportioning, but isn't it also? Yeah. Do you want me to answer a question one, one by one? Yeah. OK. Yes, thank you very much for that question. It's a very interesting uh, question. And you're right that um, in the end, you know, looking at, 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 at decisions means looking at responsibility. But I think there is a difference between responsibility and blame, because um, I think that you know, uh, if you're looking at, if, if you're, if you find in 1914 a behavior in one camp, in one state, one executive, which is at variance with the behavior everywhere else, um, you know, like a scene in a, in a, in an urban, in a suburban park where everybody's just sitting in, on the swings and having a good time and then a psychopath appears with a, with a, with a sword or something. Well, um, then you've got an, an aberrant behavior which is going to endanger the peace. And there, there you could talk about blame or, or you know, responsibility there. But if you're looking at modes of behavior, if you find that these modes of behavior are very distributed, that they are common to most or all of the actors involved, then blame becomes a less salient concept. It seems to get less and less leverage. And there you do need to talk about uh, apportioning responsibility. And of course, one does have to apportion responsibility. And the responsibility has a different quality for the different actors as well. I mean, if you, for example, if you confine your, your view to the July crisis alone, the period from the 28th of June, June to, 90, to uh, the, you know, say the 4th of August, 1914, uh, then the, the blank check does look like a, a you know, it's, one of, it's possibly the single most dangerous step taken, that they're all make, taking risks. Um, but the German risk looks a little larger than everybody else's, so you might give them a slightly larger slice of the pie of responsibility. But they're not doing anything that's essentially different from anything that anybody else is doing. On the other hand, if you stretch the chronological envelope back and look at the period 12, 13, 14, and you ask yourself the question, who is doing most to destabilize the situation in southeastern Europe, to create the, the, the circumstances in which a war is going to break out? Not, of course, in the intention of creating a war, but simply creating these risks without necessarily being aware of where they're going to lead, then your eyes would tend to wander towards Russia and France rather than towards um, Vienna and Germany, who are desperately trying to contain the kind of mayhem unfolding on the Balkans. So they're conservative powers, as it were, on the Balkan Peninsula, whereas Russia is not. So, you know, it's, um, it's complex, but the point is that nobody, no single state is playing by a different a rule book than the others. Um, and so that's why I find blame not very helpful. I think that, you know, uh, there, as you say, you're, you're, one is apportioning something, but I wouldn't call it blame, I'd call it responsibility. Okay. Um, uh, wasn't it, uh, so I remember uh, many countries, uh, people sa uh, said, or the, 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 the ruler said, it will be a short war. So before Christmas, you, were, were, you, you are at home. Was it that they expected a short war because uh, they had no, uh, because it was a modern war with, uh, with airplanes and new kind of equipment, and they thought, oh, uh, such an industrial war will be a quick one? Mm. That's another very interesting question. Well, the, um, the story on that is the jury is still out on this. It's difficult to resolve this question. It used to be thought there was a, 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 a sort of topos in the literature, the short war illusion, that the general staffs all thought, you know, the, the, the troops will be home by Christmas. And certainly this um, language is widely used in the press at the time and in the public sphere. Um, the picture when you look at the decision makers, the, the military decision makers themselves, is more mixed and more complex. 
Uh, there are a lot of general staff studies done on the next war, as that's what general staffs do. They're in peacetime, they haven't got very much going on. So that they, they fill their time with that sort of thing. And um, there's a very interesting study done by the Austrian general staff called Die Zahl im Kriege, you know, number, the numbers of war, where um, they come, the, 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 author of the, study, the authors of the study come to the conclusion that the next war is going to involve such vast numbers of casualties or, or deaths in the field that the newspapers won't be large enough to, you know, long enough to print all the names. Um, and they, this is because of the use of shock tactics against stationary machine guns and against artillery, fast firing artillery of the kind in which, in which the, the, the French were partic manufacturing particularly good, very fast firing, firing accurate field pieces, which had already seen service in the Balkan War, so people knew how good they were. So um, there is reason to believe that there was going to be massive carnage and that the war might drag on. Even Schlieffen, the author of the Schlieffen Plan, acknowledged in some of his notes on the plan that things might not, the, the, the blitz-like you know, strike into France might stumble, as indeed it did. We were talking about this this evening, uh, even during the, the opening phases in, in when they try and break through Belgium. The Belgians fight with such skill and determination. They slowed the Germans down. This may be one of the reasons why things go so wrong at the Marne. So, you know, um, there's a, even in the German case, there's a, a fear that the, the offensive might not prevail. So everyone believes in the idea of a swift offensive. Everybody fears that it might not work. But the problem is that the hope and the fear kind of hold each other in balance. Um, the, the, the bottom line is, effectively, that nobody in 1914 feared war enough. They didn't understand in, from their gut, as, as a gut feeling, how bad it was going to be. Uh the Middle East, by all the standards, uh, remains one of the most politically unstable uh, regions of the globe. The which which, which military... region does, sorry? The Middle, the Middle East, East yeah. The Middle East. Yeah. The cascade of military conflicts uh, unfolding in that region currently from the war in Syria and uh, the disaggregation of Iraq and the subsequent rise to prominence of uh, the so-called Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant yeah. speak million in supporting uh, that evidence. Now, according to many uh, political uh, pundits, including the British MP George Galloway, the huge turmoil in the Middle East dates back to the 1916 Sykes-Picot agreement between a French diplomat, François Georges uh, Picot, and mm. a British military, uh, Sir Alan Sykes. So can we claim with a strong uh, degree of evidence and confidence that the huge hatred along tribal lines in the Middle East now, and the struggle for identity is a result of the, or is a long-lasting result of the World War I. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and um, thank you for mentioning George Galloway. I think, I think one has to be very care you know, careful to take anything George Galloway says with um, a large rock of salt. But, um, but, I, but, I, but, I, but I, everything else that you said, I agree with. I and I don't think he's wrong about this. He can't be wrong about everything. He has to be right about something. Um, <laughs> I think that, you know, um, that there's a lot in that claim that Sykes-Picot has a lot to do. Certainly, you know, the Islamic State in the Levant um, takes that view itself, and it's been, in its propaganda, it has said, you know, this is the end of Sykes-Picot. And it's also the case that after the First World War, we don't see a collapse of world empire or world imperialism. We see, on the contrary, a last desperate spasm of Anglo-French competitive imperialism in the Middle East, which completely redraws the map of the Middle East and creates... Um, havoc, which is which we are still dealing with today. So I think that you know there's a lot in that um, a lot in that in that uh, diagnosis. I don't disagree with it. On the other hand, I think that you know nothing has nothing in history has just one cause. You know the the Middle East has you know um, there are patterns of instability and conflict which extend back before Sykes Pico and have a very are a very ancient genealogy. So. Uh, it's a combination of older and newer causes, I think. But Sykes-Picot is certainly part of the mix, and so is that last, this sort of imperial land grab. As, and it all has to do, of course, with the, with the transition from coal to oil, the oil revolution, um, and oil-fired navies, when the oil-bearing countries of the world suddenly become geopolitical hotspots. Uh, and, I mean, you know, it's just incalculable the amount of damage that that has done. Um, first of all, thank you for shining a light upon this very um, complex situation uh, at that time. Um, you briefly touched upon the Yugoslav war in the 1990s. Yes. And I was just wondering, because um, these wars are most likely still fresh in the memories of a lot of people here. Um, 
and there are still a lot of nationalistic sentiments lingering around in that area. Um, I was just wondering if these sentiments, uh, together with, uh, for example, other conflicts like uh, Ukraine in, at this point, um, could cause another war, major conflict, or, you know, if not the world war, in the near future. So, speaking of 10 to 20 years. Yes, thank you very much for that question. Well, um, I think that <clears throat> you're absolutely right. Nationalist feeling has not died away uh, in the Balkans. It's still very, very strong. And I noticed that, among other things, in you know, the responses I received when I went, I went to Belgrade and took part in a... Um, you know, I'm not the most popular person in Belgrade, let's put it that way, mildly. Um, you know, I think that, um, and, and that, you know, I kept on explaining to everyone, I'm not, it w I'm not blaming the Serbs. It would be absurd to blame the Serbs for the outbreak of the First World War. I mean, that would be a completely laughable thesis. But of course, I did want to put Serbia into the picture. Serbia is a very important part of the story of how all this happens. It's not the cause of the First World War, but it's part of the mix of, you know, causes and factors and so on, which explain why people behave the way they did in 1914. Um, could there be a further major conflict? Well, um, of course, I, I'm as ignorant of the future as anybody else, but I think that um, certainly the feelings are still running very, very high. Uh, the Kosovo question uh, is, is completely not resolved, not in the, certainly not in the minds of the Serbian sort of intelligentsia, Serbian political elite. Um, I would say something more general about the Balkans is there's a lot of victimology. There are a lot of people who feel that they're the victims of history, and I think that in some respects they are. The Serbs had a terrible 20th century, um, and we have to remember that. I mean, it's the First World War was, took, took more Serbian lives as a proportion of the whole population than in any other country uh, partic that participated in the war, um, and the lives lost included the victims of atrocities, a bit like the atrocities in Belgium, but, but on a much larger scale, between 30 and 50,000. The numbers are not secure. Um, people killed by, well, I say the Austrian, but actually it was probably um, Hungarian, Honved units, um, during, the, during the opening months of the First World War. Um, and then, of course, there was a very rather tumultuous period in the interwar. Then came the Second World War with further, further horrors, and you said about its concentration camp, and uh, again, you know, civil war in Serbia itself, followed by the creation of Yugoslavia, which many Serbs now see in a rather negative light, um, not all, but some. And, um, and then followed, of course, by the wars of Yugoslav dissolution, the bombing of Belgrade by NATO, and so on. So unlike the rest of Western Europe, which has you know, a, a bad half of the 20th century, but then a period of milk and honey, uh, in Serbia, the whole century has been a trauma. And that should not be forgotten, that people still, there's a lot of pain and a lot of disorienta political disorientation and anger um, in Serbia and in, in, in other places in the Balkans as well. And we have to take that seriously and not simply just, um, you know, write it off as some kind of psychological aberration. It has to do with the complex geopolit geopolitics of the peninsula. Um, it's, it doesn't have to, it's, there's, it's, we're not talking here about essential differences between cultures, I don't think. But um, yes, I think you're right. There are still lots of unresolved issues and a further conflict is possible. Certainly that is what a lot of people uh, predict when you speak to people who are politically informed um, and even people in political office in uh, Belgrade predict further conflict over, the, over Kosovo. But I hope, of course, it doesn't happen. And I see the answer to this, um, uh, one possible answer in the admission of, of Serbia to, um, to the EU, if there still is an EU, <laughs> which I very much hope there is. Um, you talked a lot about blame and uh, the complexity of the factors and events you talked about made it clear that we cannot place the whole blame or responsibility to one country. However, when we compare this to the Treaty of Versailles, where it says that Germany has their own responsibility and should be blamed for the whole war, how is that possible then? Well, um, you know, the winners write the peace. And what was unusual about the Versailles Treaty was, I think it would have been, I think the Germans were expecting to get, you know, punished. I mean, losers always do after wars. Um, but the Versailles Peace Treaty is unusual in that, um, you, you know, I remember a sort of light went on in the back of my head when I realized that the word amnesty and the word amnesia were related. <laughs> that, that an, they are, I mean, that an amnesty is a forgetting, you know. We will forget the crimes you committed against us. We'll, we'll forget, everybody will forget the pain, his own, her own pain and hurt and we'll move on to build a peace. Now, that doesn't have to be on a level playing field. The winners can set the terms. They can extract a reparation. They can, um, they, they can make the, the defeated opponent pay for the war, and that's quite common in warfare, um, in the history of European warfare. But um, what happened at Versailles was, in addition to all of that, 
um, the, assign the assignation of blame for the outbreak of the, the, the so-called Schuldparagraf, that the word Schuld is not used in the Versailles Treaty itself. Uh, it's stated, I think the word that's used is something like the, moral, the Germans are the moral authors of the war, the Germans and their allies. Uh, nonetheless, that was enough. And in the various accompanying documents that were um, you know, published with the treaty, it was made clear that the that, that, that blame was what they were talking about. Um, yes, I think that this was a, probably a regrettable feature, that what a, you know, a punitive peace was fine, and the Germans could have accepted that, but that Article 231 stuck in people's throats. It's very interesting uh, that, that there, is n there are virtually no Germans who accept the Versailles verdict. This is the odd thing. I mean, the communists reject it as an imperialist, you know, foul imperialist peace. The Social Democrats reject it. The Centre Party of the Catholics rejects it. The left liberals, the right liberals, the DNVP, the, Na the Nationalist Party, you'd expect them to reject it. And of course, the Nazis turn it into their fetish, the, the November crime and, and so on and so forth. But, um, and the, the, the stab in the back and the Schult, 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 Schult paragraph and all this kind of thing, Schandfrieden, the, the piece of shame. Um, but a rejection of Versailles is common to all the German parties. It's very extraordinary, most unusual. And that had to do with 231, not with the punitive settlement, uh, the other aspects of the punitive settlement. When I gave a talk about you know, related issues in, about a year, year and a half ago in Berlin, there was a sort of podium discussion and the, a very brilliant journalist called Gustav Seibst turned up to do the questions and conversation. And uh, he brought with him his, um, no, it was his uncle's, his great uncle's copy, a man he'd known as a young boy and was very fond of. Um, his copy of the, it was the Volksausgabe, the sort of um, the, the popular edition of the Versailles Treaty published in 1920, you know, for, German, for the Germans to buy. And uh, it was his uncle's personal copy. And, you know, the, the booklet is virtually empty except paragraph 231 underlined in deep blue pencil with exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. This caused immense pain to his great uncle that Germany was being made to bear the sole blame for this conflict. Um, so, yes, it was, that, it was probably in retrospect, um, you know, a, a mistake to blame the entire war on the Germans or to make that part of the peace settlement. Um, given the complexity of the, and, and all the lying that went on on all sides about each state's participation in the crisis that brought war. Um, hello, um, I have a question. Many people concentrate on the negative impacts of World War I, but uh, do you imagine that our society would be like it is today if the war didn't happen, for example, in regard to women's rights, for example, Europe needed to be destructed in order to give women a right to play a crucial role in our society. What do you think about this? Well, that's a, a wonderful question. And I agree that women, the, the, you know, the revolution in the status of women in Western European societies is one of the most you know, extraordinary and um, fruitful and important revolutions of the last you know, three or 400 years. So, um, if not longer. So that, it's a, it's a, that's a great achievement. And there is a very interesting sort of counterfactual that you can run. And that is the extraordinary case of Switzerland, which of course did not participate in either of the two world wars and only granted women sort of equal political rights, suffrage rights in the 1970s. So um, it's very late to come to the sort of gender revolution or the, uh, and, and, and it also wasn't in the world war. So and there clearly is a link between this huge conflict and the, 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 and the giving of rights. You, you remind me here of, of a conversation I had with, um, with the Polish uh, journalist, Adam Chemiński, who um, we were talking about this, and I was saying, oh, it's a terrible catastrophe, and so on, and saying, it's not a catastrophe for the Poles, it's wonderful, you know, without it, we wouldn't have Poland. And um, he has a point that, you know, um, without this war, how do you get Poland? How, if Europe escapes the summer of 1914 without this war starting, and, you know, it sort of chunters on and, and the, the, the Entente breaks up or loosens and the central powers and Austria-Hungary starts to sort of collapse at the edges, but in the meanwhile, there's been a better understanding between Britain and Berlin. You know, you can imagine a sort of counterfactual world. How do the Poles get their state? They have to get it somehow because there is a Polish nation. There has been for centuries and centuries. So Adam, I think, was right to say, you know, maybe conflicts bring the, they're, 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 they're like the bushfires in Australia that burn out whole forests but make new growth possible. Um, there is, on the other hand, a disturbing um, tendency recently in public writing on war. I'm thinking of a book by a guy, I think his name is Nick Croker, um, and another one by a guy called Ian Morris called War, What Is It Good For?, which is, of course, quoting this famous song, um, which was, I've forgotten who sang it in the first instance, but it was, it was covered by Frankie Goes to Hollywood. And um, he says, 
in this book, he says, war, he's answered the question, war, what is, it, what is it good for, is a hell of a lot. War is great. Um, without wars, we wouldn't have our modern societies. The, the war creates bigger and better political units. Um, I think this is a very worrying uh, direction for us to be taking. It reminds me a little bit of the, of the tendency of intellectuals before 1914 to speak of war as a form of social and political hygiene. It clears away all the dead wood, you know, all the slowness and frustration is replaced by clearer outlines. Well, personally, I don't want clearer outlines. I would rather have boring meetings. I mean, I remember uh, someone in Brussels, I was talking to someone in Brussels about this, and he said, you know, thinking about the First World War, I sometimes feel so frustrated sitting in Brussels in these long meetings which seem to go nowhere, but then I think about the alternative, you know, which is so much worse. So <laughs> I don't think that, um, you know, I think we should um, be prepared to live with the, with the costs of peace, which are, you know, um, slower, uh, reforms will come, but they come more slowly. Um, you know, I would rather get them slowly without war than, than quickly with massive, you know, cataclysms. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Clark, for a very interesting lecture. This summer we saw a lot of commemorations on TV with regard to the outbreak of the First World War. And my question to you is, what's your impression regarding the political discourse? Um, mm. Is there any kind of discourse among uh, current politicians with regard to the outbreak of the First World War and especially with regard to responsibilities? Thank well, you. Yeah, thank you for another very interesting question. Um, well, um, I, I found it rather depressing, actually, um, the, the discourse of commemoration and so on. Not all of it, but quite a lot of it. I mean, it was particularly depressing when at the beginning of 2014, various members of the British government, I mean, Michael Gove, the Secretary, the, the Secretary of State for Education, um, weighed into the debate um, by saying, you know, a bunch of left-wing historians are trying to persuade people that the Germans weren't the, weren't, weren't, didn't start the First World War, and let's face it, they were virtually the Nazis in 1914. <laughs> They just needed a bit more polishing, and so on. I mean, it was an extraordinary piece. And um, there was a lot of that sort of jingoism going on in Britain in, at the beginning of 2014. So there was a sort of sinking back into a national perspective. Um, I, thought, I think that things were very different in France. In France, there's the, the memory of the war is conceived in a very cosmopolitan way um, around the categories of mourning, trauma, loss, and so on. There's, it's an eminently Europeanizable framework. In Germany, Germany is special. The Germans began 2000, the German government began 2014 with virtually no plans for commemoration whatsoever. And I spoke to some of the French people who were running the, the you know, the Centenaire, the whole, the whole system of commemorations and so on in France. And of course, they wanted to speak to the Germans about partner, partnering up on various initiatives. And the answer from Germany was, well, we haven't actually planned anything. Your plans sound nice, and you, we think you should go ahead with those. We, we're, not, we're not planning anything, but thank you for letting us know. And the French found this very frustrating. So I, I must say, I think that, you know, um, my own ambition, you said, what was my ambition? Is that right? What was my own hope for, the, for this discourse? Is that right? Yeah. My own hope is that, you know, that, and that's why I wrote this book in a way, was that uh, at some point it will become possible to remember this European disaster in a European way to recognize its European framework, its European contours, and to view it in that way, and to let all the voices that made this war possible you know, have their say and give, make a space for all of the actors uh, and for the place of Europe in this you know, disastrous war, uh, and the, in the inception of this disastrous war. Of course, it becomes a much bigger war uh, once it breaks up. Professor Clark, <coughs> thank you. Uh, the title of your lecture is How Europe Went to War, and uh, my question is, when did this, did this process start? Because already decades, thank you, already decades before the start of the war, World War in 1914, all the ingredients, the recipe was already uh, ready for a war because uh, England feared Germany, France was frustrated because the loss of 1870, they wanted back alsace lotharingen Russia uh, lost their power, lost their influence in the Balkan, and they wanted the Straits, the Dardanella. So all the ingredients were there, and on top, already 21 years before the war, World War started, there was a secret agreement between France and Russia, and the text became known after the, sec the First World War, and the text was included to demolish Germany. Mm. I mean, the start of this war well, was not 1914, but was m maybe already 20 years before, and could it, could it have been stopped already before? Is my question clear to you? I hope. Yes, absolutely. Oh, thank, thank you. That's a very good question. 
Okay. Well, let's start with the point you make at the end about the Franco-Russian alliance. Um, I mean, the Franco-Russian alliance dates back to the 1890s, and it's true. The Franco-Russian alliance only exists in order to hold Germany down. I mean, it doesn't have the French and the Russians have virtually no other strategic interests in common. And they're two very different political cultures. Um, it's there um, in order to, to counter German, the growing influence and power of Germany. Um, but that doesn't mean that a war is inevitable once this alliance has been signed, because if you look at how the Franco-Russian alliance functions in the later 1890s and 1900s, it actually has a tethering, muting effect rather than an escalating one. So, for example, the French are endlessly telling the Russians, don't go into the Balkans, don't take any risks in the Balkans, because France does not recognize in the Balkans a vital interest for Russia, let alone for France. And in Morocco, in 1911, the Russians warned Paris, don't try anything on with Morocco, because Russia does not recognize in Morocco a vital interest for France, let alone for Russia. They use the same words in order to make the point clear. So th this is what um, Patricia Weizmann has called um, a tethering alliance, an alliance by which the two partners try and manage each other and hold each other back. And to some extent, the Germans do the same with the Austrians in the Balkans, 1912 and 13. So these alliances have a complexity about them which allows them to function in different ways. But what happens to the Franco-Russian alliance, and this is where your question gets uh, its salience from, is that in, from 1912 onwards, as the Balkan Wars take off, Raymond Poincaré, the French president, and his Russian interlocutors begin to change the remit of the alliance. They change the meaning of the alliance by agreeing that in future, um, if a quarrel breaks out in the Balkans, in particular between Austria and Serbia, then France will support Russia in an intervention, even if Russia is not herself under attack or under threat of attack or mobilization. So there, a, a mechanism is created which could cause a war. That's true, which could cause a war. Though that's not the plan, they're not planning to cause a war. But it is a piece of causality which, if a certain set of other conditions are met, could help to bring a war about. I wouldn't say it more strongly than that. But in connection with the Anglo-German antagonism you were mentioning, well, that, that again has been, I think, overplayed in a lot of the literature. The, by 1911, uh, the Germans have absolutely clearly lost the naval war. The British should no longer feel fundamentally threatened by the German Navy. Um, and the and Tibbet says, we can't keep up, forget it, we're, we're going to stop trying. And the Germans begin in 1912-13 to shift funds towards the army because the, the Navy is simply never going to catch up with Britain's infinitely superior fiscal and naval system. Um, at around about the same time, uh, the British start to get more and more irritated with the Russians, especially over Central Asia. And so by the summer of 1914, we know it has recently been uh, rediscovered and, and discussed in the, in the, in the journals, we know that in the summer of 1914, the British Foreign Office briefs or prepares the personal secretary of the Foreign Secretary, a man called Sir William Tyrrell, for a mission to Berlin. And the idea is to, to sound out the possibilities of a, of a better understanding with Berlin after dropping the, uh, the, the convention with Russia. Now, this, is a, a, this mission never takes place because then the war happens. But the point I'm making is that this period before the war was as, as pregnant with possible futures as our present is. I mean, it didn't have to be the future that came to pass. Uh, there were other futures, and you can, once you become sensitive to this, you can see these under other futures wherever you look. You can see people looking into different futures that didn't happen. Uh, and I think it's very important to remember that and not to think of the, of the future as foreclosed. We have this tendency to adopt a double standard to the past, a different one from the standard we apply to the present. We think of the present as open and full of possibilities, but of the past as closed and doomed. But that's not the case. That's why choice is so important, because people have, people, when, when powerful people make choices, they choose between different possible futures. Okay. Um, you ended by um, explaining that putting the blame on any single party is not very uh, useful. Um, now, I know you're a professor of history, but nevertheless, I would like to ask you in the present European crisis about Ukraine, there's a large tendency to put the blame on um, President Putin as the single uh, person or single power in this, uh, in the road bad guy. Mm. Would you comment on that or are you? Yes, I'd be glad to comment on that. I mean, again, I think in history, as I said to the gentleman before, um, in history, there's never just one cause. and. Um, you know, to say it's Vladimir Putin alone is just, you know, um, is trying to tear up world peace and so on, and he just wants war for war's sake or, or conflict for conflict's sake would be a great, just, that's just propaganda. 
I think that you know it's a, what's produced the Ukrainian crisis is a very complex um, convergence of different historical vectors. And one of these is eastward enlargement of the EU, which I think was, you know, is a process which um, it's not it's not a bad process in itself, but it's been undertaken, I think, with perhaps, um, you know, uh, in, in in a spirit of how shall I put it, geopolitical naivety. Um, I think it was naive of the ENP, the European um, neighborhood, neighbor, neighborhood Policy, to extend to Kiev a kind of choice between the West and, um, and Moscow. I think that was geopolitically naive. It wasn't done to start a war or to start a conflict. It was done in the, the wonderful spirit of the EU. You know, we're having a party. Everybody's having a great time. Why didn't you come around as well? Um, but after all, it was a very deep form of intervention in the inner life of Ukraine because it, was, it, 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 it um, pegged the, um, the signing of an association agreement to quite deep reforms. Um, and so in other words, it was actually in, uh, intervening deeply in the mechanisms of, domestic mechanisms of Ukrainian political life. And finally, there's the whole, um, you know, complex dynamic of Ukrainian society itself, which is a, it's a tumultuous area. It's not a, a country which has a long history of homogeneous statehood. Um, it's deeply demographically diverse. And uh, it has a very complex history and a very brief and, you know, unresolved history as a nation state. So uh, all those, put all those things together, and you have the, 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 the you know the means the, the the ingredients for conflict. That doesn't mean that I I don't see Mr. Putin as contributing his own special how shall I put it chemistry to the current instability. Um, but uh, he's a very special person in many ways. But um, nevertheless, to, just to, to see it as um, you know his to, to his fault alone is is you know a drastic reduction of the um, of the of the complexity of this problem. Incidentally, one last point about Putin. People who are close to Putin, a number of them have said that the moment when Putin sort of shifted to a more intransigent line, uh, when his trust in the West plummeted, had to do with the Libyan intervention of 2011, when um, a, a brief intervention which he supported in the Security Council um, drifted into regime change, the murder of Gaddafi in the most horrible way on the streets of, of, of the capital, and, um, you know, Putin felt, I've been... I've been uh, tricked, I've been double-crossed um, by my Western partners in inverted commas. And what's interesting there is, of course, we have another Libyan milestone, 2011, just as 100 years before, in 1911, the Italian war on Libya helped to destabilize the Balkans. Um, thank you very much, Professor, for coming here, first of all. And, okay, in a, at a certain stage in your lecture, you stated that um, the involvement of the single countries in the conflict was not the product of a trend, a pattern, but the product of uh, last minute choices, in a sense. Um, well, if you, from what I could understand from a book by uh, Dennis Max Smith on modern Italy, I sort of identified a pattern that goes from like the end of the uh, crispy legislation in 1896 up to 1915, in which you can see that Italy is sort of drifting apart the, uh, from the um, Triple Alliance. And so it's sort of directing towards uh, the Triple Entente. I mean, if you look, like at, if you look at uh, the Prinetti Barrer Agreement, the position of Italy in Algericus, the Reconigi Agreement, you can actually see that there is, there is a pattern. Um, would you like to comment on that? Thank you very much. Well, yes, the, it's true, as you say, that Italy is um, not a reliable member of the Triple uh, Alliance. Um, in fact, the Triple Alliance is a misnomer. Um, Italy had, by 1914, made such a sort of fabric of agreements with um, France in particular, but also with Britain, uh, sort of formal and informal ones, that um, Edward Grey wrote to, um, to well, said to his friend Paul Combon, the French ambassador in London, he said, the, the, the Italians are much more useful to us um, outside our alliance. They're much more useful as allies of the Germans and Austrians than they could ever be as allies of France and Britain. Um, and we should try and keep them in that alliance um, because they're better friends to us as enemies than they would be as friends. So um, I think what you say about Italy is right. Um, it is a sort of, you know, drift away from the central powers. I don't think that, you know, I, I, there are also, as you say, trends and patterns that can help to account for this war. 
Uh, and of course, one can't explain anything in history without an understanding of the slow structural shifts in the environment that you know, make, a walk, make, make these sorts of events possible. On the other hand, um, surely, and this is the case that the book really wants to make, what's really striking about the last few years before 1914 is the rapid, short, sharp changes in the system. You know, I just gave the example of the Balkans. That's just one example. But, you know, the sudden appearance of Albania, the, um, the, 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 the naval race between the dreadnought race, between the Greeks and the Turks, which gets the, the, the Russians really, really worried. Um, the collapse of Austria's geopolitical security apparatus in, in, on the Balkan Peninsula. The shift of Russian interest from Sofia in, in Bulgaria to Belgrade in, in Serbia. Um, you know, there are dozens of other examples one could give. What's really striking about this environment is how swiftly it's changing. And that means a sort of atmosphere of panic prevails among those who have to make decisions. Everybody's improvising. They've scarcely had time to catch up with the last change, and already there are new events. Events acquire a kind of raw power. The reason I make this point is because, you know, it was very popular among historians in the 1970s and 60s, 70s, and 80s to, to quote a wonderful sort of almost proverbial um, phrase by Fernand Baudel, the great exponent of the, uh, the École des Annales in, in France. Uh, and Baudel once compared, and he's been quoted billions of times, that the, the, it's been sort of metastasized across the literature. Um, Baudel said, you know, events are just the warm, contemptible foam um, that rides on the backs of the great waves of history's structures, of structural history. So what matters in history is the structures, slow structural change, and events are just soft foam. Well, I, I, I don't think that's right. I think that events can have a raw power uh, and structures can be quite soft and uh, lukewarm. Um, it doesn't have to be, it can be the other way around. Events can transform structures. So I want to keep patterns and long-term uh, developments in play, but I also want to sort of make space for the power of events. Incidentally, a power which we've recently um, had to reacquaint ourselves with. Sorry. Uh, Professor Clark, thank you very much for your very interesting lecture. Um, I would like to ask you a question about the uh, current discourse about the First World War or the outbreak. Um, the historian Heinrich August Winkler has argued that um, you underestimate the responsibility of Germany in your book. I'm very mm. sorry, it's kind he of... He would, funny. wouldn't he? Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and I would like to ask you if you think there might be in the shift of the debate towards a smaller responsibility of German, uh, Germany, um, if that might be playing to the cards of, let's say, more right-wing or nationalist uh, uh, opinions in Germany? Well, th that's a, I'm very glad you asked that question, um, because I, it's not my intention to acquit the Germans of, if, if we're going to be blaming people, we certainly have to give German, the Germans some of the blame, and I, and I don't, um, in fact, you know, a good, a good share of the blame. I mean, I think if you, and I have no objection if someone wants to say, well, um, when we divide up the pie of blame, let's give the Germans a slightly larger slice than anyone else. That wouldn't bother me at all. I think, okay, fine, whatever, if you're very interested in the sizes, the exact size of the slice. Um, I've suggested before that, you know, I think the size of the slice depends on how you frame the events that bring the war about. If you just look at the July crisis, the German, size looks a bit, German slice looks a bit bigger. If you look at the whole period, 12 to 14, it looks smaller. So, um, you know, as I say, I can see some room for movement around that, and I don't want to, certainly do not want to acquit the Germans of, of blame. And I, in the book, I mention all the key points of German culpability. You know, the, um, the willingness to risk a preventive war, the decision to use, um, to, to seek a local, a local war between Austria and Serbia, but to accept the risk of a Russian intervention, and to accept that risk because the Germans believed if they had to fight a war now, that would be a better option than fighting a war in a couple of years. So the Germans take, very knowingly take big risks. Of course, they're not alone in doing that. Everybody's playing a game of risk um, in this environment. Um, so I don't want to acquit the Germans. I just wanted to show that we find very similar patterns of behavior elsewhere. Um, and so I don't, you know, I think it would be ludicrous to suggest that, you know, my account um, suggest, proposes a, a, a version of German foreign policy which young nationally minded Germans today could be proud, for example. You know, they might look back at the Kaiser and think, what a far-sighted monarch, what excellent decisions. And so on, the Kaiser's clearly, you know, complete, complete the, uh, you know, he's like a sort of a dog off the leash. So, um, you know, there are real problems um, there. And uh, there's, a, there's the, the, the idiocy of the fleet of the challenge to Britain without, a, you know, building ships without any adequate sort of diplomatic program in which to embed that challenge. Uh, and there are lots of other things. But what one can't find is Germans acting in a way which is, you know, categorically different from everybody else. Uh, 
Um, there's provocative behavior going on on all sides. That's the key problem. So my idea was to complicate the story, but certainly not to, to, to let the Germans, you know, let, let the Huns off the hook, as one um, hostile uh, review suggested I was doing. Um, I get a lot of this kind of thing. I mean, I got a review in the, uh, in the um, Spectator, which um, said, you know, uh, Professor Clark must wear a pickle halber uh, as, when he gives his, he must wear a pickle halber when he gives his lectures in Cambridge. Um, and accused me of having been awarded some kind of Nazi medal by the German government. Um, I mean, there's a lot of that sort of stuff going on. Um, if, if revisionists, if, if you know, sort of right-wing revisionists take comfort from my book, I'm, I regret that, and I don't, and I, it's not something I intended. I'm not, address, I didn't write it for them. Um, I'm just um, trying to complicate the picture. And people who were taking comfort from the book for revisionist reasons were already revisionists before they read my book. I don't think I've changed the scene in that respect at all. Well, I think um, I would like to leave it at this. I mean, I think this was a fascinating debate with the audience here for more than half an hour. I think we Me exploited too. you uh, up to the limit. Um, I think it's also fascinating to have you here with us here in the city of Maastricht. As I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the first country or the first independent country at that time, Germany invaded on August the 4th, 19. 14 was Morisnet. Yeah, and I think few people know that, that actually this was the first alliance and then moved from Plombier here down to uh, Maastricht and to some extent uh, talking about positive impacts of the war, of course this region became totally pro-Dutch uh, following the war, having seen the disaster of mm. this uh, mm. uh, tremendous dramatic catastrophe and I think it is after 2000, after 1918 that actually the guilder became accepted as the currency and that basically around Maastricht the region really became Dutch mm. uh, in the sense of the alliance towards the Netherlands. So this is a historical place. I'm delighted that you were here to tell us more about how Europe went to war in 1914 and I think we had a fantastic Cheng Tan's lecture and I think he would have been proud to listen to you here if you still would have been here with us. So, Professor Clark, many, many thanks for this lecture. I think we had a fascinating evening here all together. And with this, I close the session. And you can, of course, have uh, buy copies of the book of Professor Clark here in the front row. Thank you for your presentation.